This is part of the 2021 Year of Space, the latest in our theme year programme. This year, we're directing our gaze upwards beyond the Earth to examine rocks, dust, gas, and other matter across the universe to understand the formation and development of other planets. We have a fantastic, we have a fantastic programme of public lectures, outreach activities and newsletters um, and, and conferences throughout the year. So please stay tuned to our social media channels and newsletters for more announcements. Today, we have the fantastic Professor Sarah Russell. Welcome, Sarah, Merit Thank Researcher you. in the Earth Sciences Department at the Natural History Museum in London. And she's going to be taking us on a journey through our solar system, exploring how geology began. A reminder, if you're watching with school children, if you'd like to take part yourself, we are running a treasure hunt in this lecture. There are a number of Geological Society badges being shown on the screen right now, hidden in Sarah's slides throughout the talk. Your challenge is to collect them on uh, collect them all on the check form we sent through with your registration information. Also, keep an eye out for the for a few polls that we're going to run later in the talk, asking some quiz questions about Sarah's talk. Also, if you have any questions for Sarah, we will be doing a Q&A session at the end of the talk. Please put your questions in the Zoom Q&A box or in the chat on YouTube channel, depending on where you're following from. We will collect questions and put them to Sarah at the end of the talk or answer them in the chat where we can. So, without further do, I will hand over to Sarah, who will take us on this fascinating journey. Great. Thank you very much, Florence, for that introduction. Um, let me see if I can get... Bear with me a second. Huh. Can't get my slides to move forward. No, oh, there we go. Okay, so my name is Sarah Russell. I'm from the Natural History Museum, where I uh, study the formation of the solar system using our fantastic collection of meteorites as a tool. I'll tell you a little bit about that as we go through the talk. Um, and I just wanna say, I'm really delighted to be part of this Geological Society Year of Space. And I'm really looking forward to all the other talks that are gonna happen in this series as well. Um, so just since I'm the first talk uh, of this series, I'm going to introduce you first to our solar system. So, of course, the most by far the most massive object in our solar system is our sun in the centre of our solar system. So this is a, a ball of hydrogen and helium that's actually creating new elements in its centre by hydrogen fusion. Um, and then surrounding um, the sun are the planets. The innermost one is Mercury, which is going to be the subject, I think, of next uh, month's talk. Uh, and then, oh, uh, and then Venus, the Earth's evil twin that's almost the same size as, as the Earth, but which has this runaway um, greenhouse um, gas causing its surface to get very hot. Then our planet, the Earth, and its unique moon, which is also going to be a subject of one of the talks in this series. Uh, and after that is Mars. So you may have heard Mars is super in the news at the moment. So uh, yesterday, uh, a spacecraft from the UAE actually went into orbit around Mars. And today, another spacecraft from China uh, went, uh, arrived at Mars as well. And next week, uh, a NASA um, mission is, uh, Mars 2020 is going to land on the surface of Mars. So it's a super exciting time for, for Mars scientists right now. Uh, out, Woods from Mars, we reach the asteroid belt, which is um, a belt of small rocky bodies. And uh, it doesn't really look like this. It looks like this in sci-fi movies, but actually it's a lot less dense and more spread out in, in real life. So um, asteroids are about a kilometer across. They are uh, a million miles or two away from each other in the asteroid belt. Uh, and then comes Jupiter, the largest planet in our solar system. Uh, and its many moons, then beautiful Saturn, of course, and its lovely rings. Uh, and then finally, Uranus and Neptune. So these outer planets all possibly have uh, diamonds raining down in their interiors. So they're really exciting places. So these are the planets in our solar system. Okay, so just to give you an idea of scale of our solar system, here there's an image of uh, the innermost parts of the solar system. So that is the four rocky planets. Uh, that is uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. The asteroid belt 
and Jupiter. Uh, but you'll see this innermost part of the solar system is really only a tiny part of the whole solar system if you look at the uh, larger planets as well. And then our dwarf planet Pluto on the outside. Um, maybe you thought I'd forgotten about Pluto, I hadn't really. Um, but Pluto isn't considered a planet anymore because we know there are other objects that are kind of similar in size to Pluto also in our solar system. So one example is Sedna, which is, is shown uh, here outside the orbit of Pluto. And if we, if we look out again at, at uh, the orbit of Sedna, you see it has a massive journey around the solar system. So at the moment, it's fairly close to um, uh, the sun relative for, for its orbit, but it can go really far out away from the sun. Uh, and even Sedna is not uh, where the solar system ends. So surrounding our solar system is a shell of icy bodies called the Oort cloud, which are bodies that are only very loosely gravitationally attached to our solar system, but they make our whole solar system absolutely massive. Okay, so this is the first quiz question. Um, just to warm you all up, now you may, uh, you should have a poll if you are on the Zoom call. And please, can you answer this question? How many planets are there in our solar system? Are there eight, nine, or are there loads? Uh, so if you're on Zoom, please answer. Um, uh, great, got loads of answers coming in. And um, I think you have to answer in order to get rid of the, of the, of the window. And 82% uh, of people say eight. Um, okay, so we're gonna end polling, 81%. Great. Do I share results? Okay, fantastic. 81% of people are saying there's eight, which of course is absolutely the right answer. There we go. Well done. So there used to be nine, um, but um, Pluto has been demoted to a dwarf planet because of these, all of these other objects around that are similar to Pluto. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the great galactic cycle of stars and how stars are formed. Uh, so the solar system start, well, I'll, I'll, I'll start back, back, back with the start of the universe. The universe started with a, with a big bang about 13.8 billion years ago. And that produced a load of hydrogen, helium, a little bit of lithium. Um, and so this was just this cloud of gas that was produced. And in some places it became a little bit denser. And in those places it could start to collapse under the force of its own gravity. So once, once it, it started getting denser, then this, this kind of went to um, kind of extremes that it um, managed to shrink down to form eventually a star. Um, the star surrounded by a disk of material. And um, in some cases, this disk of material can then go on to form the planets. The disk feeds the star and makes it bigger and bigger, and the stuff left over can form the planets. At the end of the star's life, then uh, it gives out all of the elements that it's been making while it's been burning back into, the, uh, into space, which is called the interstellar medium. So this is either as a red giant star, it will, will let out material as uh, in gentle winds, or it will explode as a supernovae and throw all of its new elements out into space. And then the cycle can start again. And um, so as time goes on, it means that new elements and heavier elements, including the ones that we have here on earth, all of the carbon that makes our bodies and all of the rock forming elements like silicon and iron that make our planet, as these start to form, uh, in these later generations of stars. Uh, so there's more elements available for making planets. Okay, so how are planets made? So um, I'll show you some evidence from various kind of strands of information that means that we, we know basically planets started out from dust and gas, uh, the material that was inside the interstellar medium. And that then was processed while it was in this disk around the star into pebbles and then into planetesimals, into small baby dwarf planets and eventually into 
fully formed planets. Um, and how can we learn about this process? So there are four main ways, or at least four main ways that I'm gonna talk about in this talk. First of all, we can make observations of planets that are actually forming around other stars, and we can use that to infer how our own planetary system, the solar system, forms. Secondly, we can look at meteorites. So uh, the meteorites that I'm going to be talking about today are all from asteroids, and these are the oldest known rocks in the solar system, and they're the building blocks of planets. So they form very, very early on in solar system history. I'll talk about their ages a bit more in a while. Um, also, we can look at planet formation using computer simulations. So um, we can write computer code to create tiny particles in a computer. We can tell the computer how big they are, how fast they're moving, how they're gravitationally attracted to each other, and then wait and let the program run and see what is produced during uh, that kind of simulation. And finally, we can actually go on space missions to explore uh, these asteroids that we think are ancient relics of our solar system. Okay, so to start off with planet observations, um, so over the last uh, few decades, there's been an amazing amount of new information about how planets form around other stars. And it started off here with the Hubble Space Telescope. So this is an image of the Orion Nebula, which is a stellar nursery. It's a place where new stars are forming. Uh, and these little squares are uh, close-up pictures of actual stars that are forming. And you can see that most of them have these, these dusty um, envelopes around them, which are the protoplanetary disks from which the planets will, will form. So then later generation telescopes like uh, ALMA in the Atacama um, can image uh, this planet formation at even higher resolution. So this is one of the ALMA images. So ALMA lo is looking at the distribution of dust around a star. Um, and it shows, this image shows a star in the center surrounded by rings of dust. And the gaps in the rings are actually quite interesting. We think these might be where planets are starting to form. As a planet forms and it plows an orbit around its star, it is like one of those uh, mechanical uh, vacuum cleaners and it sweeps up all of the dust that's in its path. And so it forms gaps in these dust rings. Uh, there's another image here, a more recent image from also from ALMA. And uh, this uh, is thought to perhaps have uh, formed these gaps in the rings, perhaps from, from the movement around, in and out of a single planet. Okay, so as well as seeing planets in the process of forming, from these dust ring galaxy have also shown there are actually already formed planetary systems in, uh, uh, ooh, sorry, I'm getting an error message. I hope you can all hear me. Um, so uh, we can also see there are actual planetary systems around other stars. And this is such an amazing development. When, when I started in science, there were no known planets around other stars. When I started in science, there were nine planets and they were all in our solar system. And now there's only eight in our solar system, but there's thousands um, around other stars. Uh, so most of these have been observed by this space mission called Kepler. So Kepler is actually a space telescope and it has the sole function of trying to look for planets and especially Earth type planets. Uh, and it does this by staring at a star and seeing if the star dims because a planet is moving across the front of the star. And from that, you can work out um, how big they are and how far away they are from their star. So this way, Kepler has found over 2,500 different planetary systems, found planets of all shapes and sizes, uh, and found systems that have multiple planets orbiting around one star as well. So this suggests that our solar system is not particularly special in our galaxy. Okay, but next I'm gonna go uh, on to talk about meteorites and what they can tell us about the formation of our own solar system. Excuse me. So meteorite, a type of meteorite called chondrites 
formed in the very earliest part of the time of the solar system. These are pieces of asteroid that just accumulated the material from the protoplanetary dust, the disk uh, that was around our early sun. And if we look at a chondrite in detail, we can see it has several features. The most common of these are called chondrules. They're rounded objects. They can be brownish or darkish. Sometimes they're a bit lighter in color, but they're usually round in shape. And then also we find things called calcium aluminum rich inclusions or CAIs, which are more irregular in shape and they, they're always white in color. And these two things I'm going to compare later on in my talk. Okay, this is a closer up image of a chondrite meteorite. And um, this has a field of view of about one centimeter. Uh, and you can see the round, oh, you can see the rounded chondrules here, for example, and here. And they're surrounded by a fine grain matrix. So we believe these are just cosmic sediments of the material that was floating uh, around our early sun. Okay, so that brings me to my next quiz question. So, um, uh, so this is a geological question for you geologists out there. It's the texture of chondrites A, sedimentary, um, or B, igneous, C, metamorphic. So sedimentary rocks on Earth are usually formed by the action of uh, uh, water, but they're just accumulations of material from different sources. Igneous rocks form from melting and metamorphic rocks formed uh, from the uh, rock being heated up and compressed. Okay, are we nearly done? Okay, so this, I can say this pole is actually much closer. Um, and um, they, I'm gonna end the poll. And the results say that most of you think that this texture is sedimentary and I would agree with you. And particularly the um, meteorite that I showed you definitely has a sedimentary texture, but the people who said different things are a tiny bit right as well because the chondrules themselves have an igneous texture. They themselves have been melted. They've been melted. They were tiny molten droplets of, of rock that were floating around our sun. Uh, and also some chondrites have been metamorphosed as well. So I can understand why you chose those options, but I think that the, um, the sample that I showed you was actually sedimentary in texture. Okay, get rid of that. Okay, so well done everyone who said sedimentary. My slideshow is being slow going forwards. I don't know why. Let me see. There we go, sedimentary. Okay, so another amazing thing about chondrites is their com chemical composition. So if you measure the abundance of all the elements in chondrites that you possibly can, um, and then you compare it to measurements of the solar photosphere, which is the outermost layer of the sun that's most visible to us, then you can see for nearly all elements, there's a fantastic correlation. So they have the same abundance in both these meteorites and in the sun, except for hydrogen and helium, which of course are by far the most abundant elements in the sun. You have to take those out because otherwise it wouldn't be fair to compare it. Um, so this tells us that the chondrites and therefore asteroids and therefore all of the rocky stuff in the solar system actually does have a, has a genetic connection to our sun, that it was formed from the same initial material, the same cloud of material. Okay. And looking in a little bit more detail now uh, at CAIs and chondrules. So these are objects that form separately within the protoplanetary disk, but they have slightly different textures. So CAIs um, can be melted, but most of them uh, were never melted. They have a fluffy texture. They're a little bit like snowflakes, which are also condensates, very, very porous. And we think they form from uh, the solidification of a very hot gas. So it was a hot gas so, uh, cooled down and the elements went directly from being in a gaseous form to
to being in a solid form. And then in contrast, chondrules are much more compact. They're, they're always spherical uh, and they've all, all of them show signs of having been melted. So these were liquid droplets in our protoplanetary disk. And I should probably say at this point that it's one of the great mysteries of meteoritics that we don't actually know exactly uh, what the heat source was that formed chondrules. We don't really understand very well how they formed, but we do know that the, those hot little tiny little things were floating around um, in this protoplanetary disk at the beginning of the solar system. And in between the chondrules and CAIs is a fine grain matrix. And the matrix is has made of tiny, tiny little particles um, that are less than one micron, that's a millionth of a meter uh, big. Most of it is not properly crystalline, but it's got little bits of chondrules in it. Uh, and it also has quite a lot of organic material in it, which might actually help the whole meteorite stick together and therefore the whole asteroid stick together. Um, so it may play a role in being a, a glue for the whole object to form. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to talk about is the age of these objects. And um, if you know anything about meteorites already, you'll know that these are really, really old. And, and sometimes it gets a bit boring saying, oh, this object's really old. Oh, that one's really old too. Oh, that one's really old too. Um, so this brings me to, I think, the final poll, which are, can you guess how old chondrites are? Are they around 4,500 years old? Are they around 4,500 million years old? or are they around 4,500 billion years old? Okay, so I'll just let the poll run a little bit. Okay. Nearly ready. Okay, let's end the polling. So 0% um, of people said they're 4,500 years old, which is Great, they are definitely not that young. Um, and the most popular, oh yeah, okay. So the most popular option was 4,500 million years old, which is the right answer. But surprisingly, a lot of people uh, thought they were even older than that. But 4,500 billion years is actually even older than the Big Bang. And now my presentation is being slow again. So the next thing I'm going to show you is um, actual data to show how old they are. I'm not just going to tell you that, well, I am sort of, I'm going to tell you how, how old they are. And I can talk in more detail in the discussion, if you like, about how we know that. Um, but uh, one of the things that I've done in my career is um, actually measuring the ages of chondrules and CAIs. Is it ever going to go forward? I don't know. Uh, and so I want to show you some of that data. Oh, there we go. Right, so uh, this slide, I'll, I'll take a bit of time on, it's maybe a little bit complicated, um, partly because of my very poor um, drawing skills. Uh, so in this diagram, the blue and pink weird look shaped things, my son said they look like popcorn, are actually the CAIs. Um, and the chondrules are these rounded objects here. And the time absolute time scale is here. And the absolute time scale is calibrated by Martin Bizarro and his group. Um, so this is one of the seminal publications about this. Um, but other publications uh, like uh, this one I was involved in kind of agree with this kind of broad outline. And these data suggests that CAIs always are the oldest objects that we measure. And this is all using uh, lead isotope dating. So uh, an element uranium is radioactive and it decays to the element lead. And by looking at how much radiogenic lead, that is lead that has been produced by decay of uranium has built up in these rocks, we can measure how old they are. Uh, the CAIs, are always uh, between four, five, six, seven, and four, five, six, eight million years. And these have been measured really precisely with less than a million years uh, error bar. And the chondrules, in contrast, have a range of ages. Some of them do seem to be as old as the CAIs, but some of them are several million years younger. 
uh, but none of them are super are, are more than around five million years younger than CAIs. And that makes us think that these objects were forming in our protoplanetary disk within about five million years or so. And after that time, probably most of the dust in the protoplanetary disk had cleared. So there weren't any chondrules floating around anymore. They'd all been swept up to make um, asteroids and planets. And so we think this will map on to, if we look at the big scale view, this maps onto uh, star evolution uh, in this way. So the CAIs formed right at the beginning of solar system history when the star was really just beginning to collapse and form. Uh, the chondrules formed when there was a, a dusty disk around the star, and then they stopped forming when the protoplanetary disk started to really clear out, except for the outermost portion, which would make uh, the Kuiper belt and the Oort cloud. Okay, so now I want to move on to the next process of planet formation. Once you've cleared your disk and, and made asteroid sized objects, and the next stage is to uh, undergo a process which is called differentiation. So a lot of these objects, when they formed, they contained radioactive isotopes, and that meant that they would get pretty hot, and hot enough, in fact, to melt. And as they melted, the denser elements, like iron, would sink down to form a core, and the lighter elements, like silicon, magnesium, would um, go upwards to form a mantle, uh, and then, uh, during more evolution, a thin crust would, would also form. And this process is called differentiation, and all of the inner planets have, have undergone this process. And it's because of differentiation that we live on a planet that has a magnetic field with an iron-rich core. So we can't actually sample our own Earth's core, but we can get an idea of what it might be like by looking at meteorites. So some meteorites, not chondrites, some, but other meteorites have melted. And these are samples of asteroids that can tell us about the differentiation process. Um, so many meteorites are made mostly of iron and they probably represent the core of a large asteroid that got um, disrupted. Um, some meteorites uh, represent mantle material um, and some represent crustal material. And then there are some meteorites that may come from the boundary between the core and the mantle because they have both iron and they have silicate in them as well, which we expect from the mantle. Okay. So getting asteroid sized objects then into planets is the next stage of planet formation. And once an asteroid or planet planetesimal, a small baby planet, is uh, more than about a kilometer or so in size, then it will undergo a process called runaway growth. And that's because it will start to have its own gravity and um, objects that are flying around the solar system nearby will smash into it and ultimately will allow it to grow. Um, and by looking at this process of runaway growth, uh, we can, uh, well, people that look, make computer simulations can look at how the solar system formed. Uh, so this is the simulation by John Chambers, and it starts off with a bunch of small uh, objects, which uh, we call asteroids or planetesimals, and he sees what happens if they're allowed to smash into each other just from the forces of gravity. Um, so here on the, on the x-axis is the distance from the sun, um, where one AU is the distance between the Earth and the sun. And so let's have a look at the, how this simulation goes. We start, these objects start to get bigger and bigger, so they move upwards on this graph, and you end up with four planets, which frankly look very much like our solar system. So this could be Mercury, Venus, Earth, and finally Mars. So it is possible to make our solar system uh, just assuming that it grows through this process of, of gravity attracting these larger objects to each other and by colliding with each other. But people that run computer simulations have taught us something else as well, and that is that the planets can actually move around and migrate. Uh, and this is one example, which is called the Nice model, but there are other models um, that have, have been published separately. And the Nice model suggests that in the earliest times of the solar system, all the planets were very scrunched up. They were very compact and quite close to the parent star. And then the larger planets started to get into a resonance with each other. They started to um, interact with each other 
in a way that actually meant they got thrown outwards. And in this particular simulation, actually there's an extra planet in our solar system that actually gets thrown out during this process. So I think it's about to start again now. So it starts here, very compact solar system. And there's lots of tiny icy bodies around the outside that haven't um, managed to um, uh, accrete into a planet. But during the migration, these small icy objects get thrown into the inner solar system, which is good for us because it makes them into asteroids that we can then sample. Okay, so um, we can actually go and see these asteroids as well as just waiting for them to fall to Earth as meteorites. And there are three space missions so far that have successfully gone to an asteroid that's near Earth and brought material back. Um, well, or is in the process of bringing material back. Um, so the first two are Japanese missions, which are now returned to Earth. These are Hayabusa and Hayabusa 2. Uh, Hayabusa actually just came back in December 2020, very recently. Um, Hayabusa 1 visited an S-type asteroid, which is a very uh, stony asteroid. And Hayabusa 2 is uh, visited a different sort of asteroid called the C-type asteroid, which we think is richer in carbon. And then NASA have also have an asteroid return mission in progress, uh, which called the Cyrus Rex, which launched in 2016, and um, which is visiting a different type of asteroid again, but it's related to the C-type carbon-rich asteroid. Um, so these are really exciting missions for people who are studying planet formation, because we believe that asteroids, particularly like the target of Hayabusa 2 and Osiris Rex, are really the building blocks of uh, the planets in our solar system and can tell us about this process of solar system formation. Okay, so I'm going to talk about Osiris-Rex first, which is a mission that I've been um, involved in for longer. So it launched in 2016 and then it went uh, around the sun and a year later it came close to the earth again and its gravitational interaction with the earth meant that it could get uh, kind of catapulted into a different direction called the slingshot catapulted towards um, its target asteroid, which is called Bennu. Um, it collected a sample on the surface of Bennu a couple of months ago in October 2020, and it's due to come back to Earth in 2023. Um, so I was lucky enough to watch it launch in Cape Canaveral in the US, so I will have to show everyone my pictures. So this is a picture of the launch. This is it going into the skies, the last time the science team actually saw the spacecraft. Um, and then this is all, all of us watching around the, uh, watching the, the launch of the object. So first of all, I'm going to tell you why we um, study, uh, why we chose the asteroid Bennu as the target of the Cyrus Rex um, mission. Uh, and it would seem like there's lots of asteroids to choose from because there's over 500,000 asteroids, but many more, probably millions of asteroids in the solar system. But of those, only just over 7,000 are near Earth, so are, are fairly accessible to us. Um, and of those, only 192 of the right sort of orbit that they are easily to, easy to get to from uh, by spacecraft. Of those, most of them are really tiny, and only uh, 26 got diameter more than, I think that should be 200 meters. Uh, and of those, only five are ice and carbon rich. And these are the ones that we're really interested in. Um, so ones that are ice and carbon rich, firstly, probably originated very much in the outer part of the solar system. And in that part of the solar system, they were less affected by heat of the sun. And so they'll preserve more of the material um, of the primordial interstellar cloud that the solar system was made from. And also these objects that are rich in ice and carbon are important because they might have um, provided water and carbon to the earth. They might have provided the ingredients that we need for life to flourish and for us to become a habitable planet. Okay, so this is a picture of um, the Bennu asteroid. And uh, one of the surprises of the mission is that it um, obviously contains quite a diverse lot of rocks. It was a lot more um, diverse than, than was expected. You can see there are some darker boulders there and some lighter boulders. The lighter boulders might have carbonate in them. Um, and uh, it also has this distinctive 
diamond type shape, which is probably because it's a, it's a rubble pile. It has quite a high porosity and it's probably just a stack of boulders and stones kind of loosely stuck together. Uh, and because it's spinning around, uh, something like that will naturally form this kind of diamond shape. Um, so the um, science team mapped the whole surface of Bennu very carefully uh, and chose where they would like to sample it. Um, they have, so they have this opportunity to sample it and bring material back to Earth uh, using this thing called the touch and go sampler. So the touch and go sampler blasts a, a jet of nitrogen gas onto the surface of the um, asteroid. And um, then um, that disrupted the pebbles and, and dust on the surface and allowed it to get captured. Um, so the um, actual capture of sample went really well. Uh, area was chosen called Nightingale that seemed to be particularly rich in this carbon rich stuff that is of interest to everybody. Um, this is what the sampler looked like after the collection. So it's kind of good news, bad news situation. So the good news is there's loads of sample collected. Um, so you can see, um, well, first of all, there are sticky pads, uh, these tiny dots around the outside of the collector are sticky pads that stuck to the surface. And these actually um, collected little pieces of dust of the surface. So there's definitely something that's stuck there. And then inside the collector looked kind of light color before the collection happened. And now it looks dark colored, so it's probably full of material. But the little problem is that um, the collector had this kind of rubbery flap that automatically plopped back down after the collection happened. And um, some little pebbles actually got stuck in the flap, which meant that it didn't close correctly, which means that some pieces, so these white dots here, are all kind of getting a uh, flying out of the collector. So because of that, um, there was a little bit of a change to the operation of the mission. So originally the plan was it, uh, the spacecraft was going to spin round and round really fast. And by doing that, it would be able to tell what the mass inside this collector was. But because it was all spilling out, they decided not to do that and just to stow it away straight away. But they're sure that they have plenty of material anyway. OK, so the other mission I want to talk about is the Japanese mission Hayabusa 2. that's visiting another uh, near-Earth asteroid called Rugu. Uh, so Bennu and Rugu are similar in many ways. They, they're both uh, near-Earth asteroids, which means they have a um, distance from the sun similar to that of the Earth. Um, they were both discovered in the same year, about 20 years ago. Um, and uh, in some ways, they're also slightly different. They seem to have a slightly different composition. So that's really great from um, a scientist's point of view, because it means we can compare and contrast the two asteroids. Okay, so this is a GIF of the Hayabusa 2 spacecraft coming towards uh, the asteroid Rugu. Um, so you can see it just starts off as being a tiny dot, and then it's slowly coming clearer and clearer. So you can see straight away, it's the same kind of shape, this diamond shape as Bennu, for the same reason, it's also a rubble pile. You can see it has this large impact uh, crater in it. Um, and um, this is what it looks like. So again, it's covered in boulders. There are some similarities and also differences to Bennu. It's actually seen to be more full of boulders than, than Bennu, which was potentially a problem for the uh, sample collection. Um, which was designed to just collect very tiny fragments of rock, but the collection went fine anyway. Um, so this is a, one of the first pictures of the arrival at Rugu. And this is the mission team at JAXA celebrating uh, the arrival at Rugu. Uh, and this mission has come back, as I mentioned, so it returned to Earth um, in December, just a couple of months ago. Uh, it uh, landed down in the Australian desert. Um, there it is with its little parachute, uh, and it was picked up very carefully. It was found by um, the recovery team very quickly and efficiently, um, taken back to Japan. There were some delays because of the COVID situation. It had to go into quarantine for a while, um, but the team have been able to uh, now open the canister and take a peek inside. Um, so my colleagues and I at the Natural History Museum are um, very eagerly waiting to hear and we're hoping to also analyze some of this material 
Um, and in the meantime, we're comparing um, the return sample to uh, the collections of meteorites that we have in, in our museum. So it looks most similar to a type of chondrite called carbonaceous chondrites. Um, so there are, these are six main types of carbonaceous chondrites. Um, so these are all examples of ones that we have in our museum collections. Um, and um, so we, we really want to analyze it to find out which, which one it most resembles. So we think maybe it might be similar to the, the CI meteorites, but they may have been heated to be, um, to be uh, turned into a slightly different kind of meteorite, or it may be similar to the CO meteorites, which have these little white dots in them, which are tiny CAIs. Um, so this is work that's gonna happen over the next few months and uh, will be very exciting for us all to, to work on. Okay, so I'm coming towards the end now. Uh, so, so in conclusion, we learn about how our solar system formed both by looking at the formation of other planetary systems using these fantastic new generation telescopes. And also we can learn about the formation of our own solar system, which happened four and a half billion years ago, um, using meteorites from asteroids that date from that time and are basically unchanged since the beginning of our solar system. So the very first rocks were created from a disk of dust and gas from which the sun and planets formed. Um, and we know that from both the observational work and also the work on asteroids uh, and the computer simulations as well. Um, we've got examples of these um, amazing rocks that are from the beginning of the solar system already as meteorites. And we're gonna get more samples from these new generation space missions um, that will be, that are active now and will remain active over the next um, few years. So thank you very much for listening. I'm really happy to take any questions and um, yeah, so thank you. Thank you, Sarah. What a fantastic talk. Um, so exciting, moving all the way through the solar system. We have lots and lots of questions coming in. Uh, lots chondrules and about uh, chondrites and also a lot about asteroids so I'm going to get started and uh, Great. we can answer on, on the Q&A now. Please keep your questions coming in. So um, how do we know which meteorites represent which component of the Earth's structure? That's one of my questions. Yeah so we know that uh, um, yeah I could have explained this in a bit more detail and I think you've got a um, talk coming up that's going to cover meteorites in more detail if I'm not mistaken um, but we can look at the bulk composition and the texture of meteorites, uh, which tells us this. So, um, so the meteorites that represent core material are made of an alloy of metal, iron nickel metal. And you can see straight away, they're very different to anything that you find on the surface of the earth. Um, they are much denser and very magnetic. And um, yeah, so I think it's very clear that these are something like core material. Uh, and then the mantle material, we can compare them to the composition of our Earth's mantle, um, at which we have some samples here on Earth. So uh, these contain different minerals, they, they're richer in olivine. Uh, and then the crustal samples, of course, we've got loads of crustal samples on, on Earth, so we can use those as a comparison. They, they tend to be basaltic. Fantastic. Okay. Um... And how do we know that asteroids are ice and carbon rich without actually sampling them? Yeah, well, that's a great question. And um, yeah, I should have maybe gone into that into a bit more detail. So we can say a bit about um, the composition of these objects using a technique called spectroscopy. So that is looking, basically it kind of looks at the color of the asteroid in, in detail and at wavelengths that we don't necessarily see in the visible spectrum. Um, and by comparing um, these measurements of uh, the reflectance of light off the object and also um, how much light they're emitting, you, we can look, we can compare that to the kind of materials that we have on Earth. And these tell us, for example, whether they contain water. So if it contains water, then it has a very distinct feature uh, in its uh, spectrum. So we can say a little bit about this composition um, just using the techniques that we have on Earth and also using um, remote sensing measurements when we're close up to the asteroid. Um, so my, my colleagues at the museum do this and, and also my colleagues at the uh, University of Oxford do this work as well. 
so well we can tell quite a lot about things yeah, on you can. the planet without yeah, actually and, going yeah, into it it's really see, great yeah and you can see if it's carbon rich these ones tend to be very very dark great and then this might be a quick one for you how many samples of meteorites are there at the collections in the museum um there are uh, oh just over five thousand different meteorites i think we've got one of the best wow. collections in the world and uh, so meteorites are divided into finds and falls. So falls are ones that are seen to fall and finds are the ones that are discovered later, either through field trips or just fortuitously. Um, and we've got a great collection of meteorite falls and that's really important because they've been collected very soon after they fell. So they tend to be much fresher and in some ways comparable to the material we'll get back from these space missions. And can you, when the museum is open, can people see the meteorite samples in the exhibitions? Yes, so the museum's closed until um, uh, the beginning of April, probably. Um, and then uh, people can see some meteorites. Uh, so we have this area called the vault at the museum, which has some of our most precious samples. And of course, the meteorites are very precious. Uh, so you can see some, some there. We don't have a exhibition dedicated to meteorites yet but uh, my colleagues and I really want to have one. That would be great. Um, other qu lots of questions coming in. Um, why did the dense cloud in the galactic stellar cycle move from a cloud to a disk? Do we know? Right uh, yeah so it, it started to collapse under its own gravity and it also had angular momentum so because it has um, a momentum this, this sort of desire to spin around, it, it tends to flatten out. Um, I'm sure there's an analogy, but I, I, can't, I can't think of it. But if something's kind of, kind of spinny, it has a tendency to, to, to try to get flatter as well. So it turns into a kind of disc type shape. Yeah. And with Uma Wuma, just forgive me if I've pronounced that incorrectly. Mm -hmm. That um, that that planet, the planet, yeah, the body that they found. Could this be chondritic, or is this likely to be completely different? Do we know? Yeah. So that so the Woomera uh, sample. So that's the return material from Hayabusa two, and um, yeah. So we're, we're just about to start analysing it. So my guess would be that it's chondritic. I, Great. I uh, so. Do you think that asteroids could contain evidence of life? No, but <laughs> we do know that meteorites uh, contain organic material and it can be quite complicated organic material. So uh, it can be, you get polyaromatic hydrocarbons, you can get some amino acids, for example, and sugars. So there's quite complicated um, uh, organic molecules in there, but we think that they formed a biogenically, they didn't form by biological processes. So they form because, um, so carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen are the most common elements and among the most common elements in the galaxy and and they bond well to each other so they, they form these these molecules but they these um, although they're not biologically formed they can they're relevant to life in that they might have helped seed uh, the earth with with the materials that that uh, the early earth needed to produce life Okay, and is it possible that we might find new elements in any of these asteroid samples? Um, no, probably Everyone not because the periodic new elements. table. Pardon? Everybody's always excited about finding new elements. Yeah, I mean the, the periodic table is already kind of quite carefully uh, is quite well defined, and and so I guess any new elements will be super heavy ones that are very unstable. And so uh, they, they won't be found in, in objects that are, are this old, are billions of years old, because any weird super heavy elements like that would have already decayed. Great. Um, another one. Uh, where do you think the next areas of robotic or crude exploration will take place after the ones that have already been announced? In our solar system, do you mean? Yeah, in our solar system. Oh. Crude or robotic explorations? I, I don't. I don't know. Where would you like I to go? I, I tell you where I'd like to go. Yeah. So I would. So so the um, asteroid sample return missions at the moment have been led by the US and NASA and and the Japanese Space Agency. I'd love to have a European-led 
asteroid sample return mission because there are loads of people in Europe who are interested in this kind of work. And then my total sort of absolute dream space mission would actually go and get a piece of an interstellar asteroid. So uh, over the last few years, there have been a couple of um, kind of interstellar interlopers, the objects that are sort of asteroids or comets sort of or somewhere in between that have come into the, our solar system from somewhere we don't know where, some in place beyond our solar system. And uh, they're so mysterious. I'd love to have a mission to go and explore one of those. Wow. Yeah, because one of the questions we had is about whether or not there are examples of meteorites from beyond our solar system or galaxy. Do we know anything yeah. about them and how might they differ? Yeah, so, so yeah, so not yet is the answer, but, the, but these uh, kind of observations of these uh, interstellar objects coming into our solar system means that it's, it's, it's possible. And the other thing to say is that inside the fine grained matrix of, of chondrites, you actually get tiny grains of stardust, of, of um, minerals that actually formed in a dying red star or a dying supernova. And these differ from the rest of the material in the meteorite, the rest of the material in the solar system um, from their isotopic composition. They, they match the exact nucleosynthesis, the synthesis of elements that's happening in that particular star. So those are an amazing uh, objects. Incredible. Um, someone has oh, a big a question you, about, sorry. sorry. Someone has <laughs> yeah. a question about one of, I think it, probably Bennu. Um, you mentioned that it had a big crater and that there were rubble piles. Are these bodies actively changing, breaking up and reforming currently? Yeah, absolutely, yes. Yeah. So I think it, it's Rugu that has this kind of very clearly defined crater on, on its surface. But yeah, but, I mean, they both have craters. They both have craters on them. And that can give you an idea of what the age of the surface is because um, you can use crater counting, counting how many craters there are, and assuming how often it should get impacted to, to work out its age. And what that tells us is, uh, although uh, we think these, these, these rocks are four and a half billion years old, the asteroid they're in now, this rubble pile, is not four and a half billion years old. It's much, much younger. So it's, it has uh, these, these bodies are continuously um, reforming. Um, they're exchanging bits with other asteroids. So that's how they get to have very diverse compositions on their surface. Um, so yeah, they're always changing. We have some quite a few questions about Mars coming up. Lots of people are probably quite excited about the Perseverance rover landing next week. Um, one question is, um, why does Earth have active tectonics and a magnetosphere, but not Mars? And mm. also, when do you think we might have staffed missions to Mars with people landing on the surface? Yeah, okay, great questions. Probably I'm not the best person to ask about either of these things. Um, so, so Mars is, is um, a bit of a, um, uh, I'm trying to think of a polite way to put this, but it's, it's quite small compared to, to what you might expect from, from the inner solar system. It's much smaller than the Earth. And uh, that could be because of the process of planet migration. It could be because Jupiter came in quite close to where uh, Mars was forming and disrupted its growth. And so I, th I think the answer about the tectonics, I think it hasn't had, it doesn't have quite such a kind of sophisticated geology as, as the Earth in part because it's smaller. But I think a Mars scientist would answer that question a lot better than me. And yeah. as to crude, mis crude per person missions to Mars, um, you know, ever since I started um, my scientific career, um, it's always been, I've always been told that, that it's like 10 to 20 years away. And I think that's still the case. But I think we are sort of, I think it's a bit more realistic, uh, 10 to 20 years away. Yeah. Okay. So hopefully, you know, if there are any kids watching, you know, they could be about the right age to be astronauts going to Mars, if that's what they'd like to do. Yeah, and I saw the other day that ESA have a call for astronauts yes, as well. That's so right. active, yeah. uh, active recruitment going on right yeah, now, if anyone's time. interested. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, right, still lots more questions coming in. Thanks so much, Sarah, for staying and answering them. Um, can it be assumed that the age of CAIs and chondrules act as evidence confirming the age of the solar system or the minimum age of the solar system? Yeah, well, they give the minimum age of the solar system correct, 
yeah, because we think they're products of the solar system, their, their chemistry and isotopes tell us that they are connected to our solar system. Uh, and so, yeah, they give the minimum age. And um, because the CAI age is, is such a firm, a firm age, there's never anything older than that. So that's why we think this might represent this time zero of when, when the sun was actually first collapsing, a real sort of beginning of the solar system. But it's very hard to um, connect the age of these solids to the age of a star. Okay. A um, couple of questions about the Oort cloud. Apologies because I've pronounced that incorrectly. One is, is it spherical? And somebody else asks, was it weakly attached to the solar system and are Oort clouds shared between the solar systems? And uh, what was the last bit? Sorry, are things shared? Are, are Oort clouds shared between solar systems? Oh, great question. Oh, <laughs> yes. I, I hope so a little bit. But uh, yes, yeah, so first of all, yeah, it is spherical. So it's different to the rest of the solar system in that respect. So the rest of the solar system is all basically on one plane because it formed from one disk. And the Oort cloud is, yeah, they're just bodies that are kind of sort of attached to the sun very vaguely. Um, so I think it extends almost a quarter of the way to the nearest next star. It's, it's insanely big and very, very likely that stars exchange uh, material amongst themselves. And, and also these stellar nurseries like the Orion Nebula, for example, you actually have lots of stars forming quite close together and uh, so I think there's a very high probability of exchange between these uh, material in these stellar clusters. Okay. Um, are nebulae like the one you showed the product of lots of smaller stars having gone nova or are they the product of one giant star going nova? Right, okay. Uh, so yeah, so that's a great question because that's the sort of question we can actually answer using meteorites so we can make um, isotope composition, uh, isotope measurements of meteorites to look at, um, yeah, where, where the material in our solar system came from. Um, but it looks like they are likely to be a product of, of many, many different uh, stars, different types of stars as well. So a mixture, at least our solar system is a mixture of red giants and supernovae and novae, so lots of all sorts of different stars contributed to our solar system. And it's very likely that's also the case in most other uh, nebulae as well. But maybe not right. all, maybe not all. So yeah, we can have different environments. Fantastic. Um, is there any chance that Voyager 1 may still encounter meteorites in its outer space journey? Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. And if there's a follow up question to this as well, which is if it does encounter meteorites or planets, will it still be able to tell? So it's, will it still be able to tell us about them? I think it's still beaming stuff back, isn't it? I think. Okay. I'm actually not 100 percent sure about um, the Voyager missions, but I, yeah, I can't remember whether they're, st they're still beaming back or not. I mean, so it might encounter something. The probability is very low because. Um, so the probability, for example, of a spacecraft encountering an asteroid when it goes through the asteroid belt is supposed to be about one in a billion. And, um, and the asteroid belt is much denser than the Oort cloud. So okay. the odds are actually very low, but it would be great. Um, question here about carbonations, carbonaceous material. Why does the Earth have so little carbonaceous material in terms of bulk comp composition? It seems very low in comparison with chondrites, for example. Yeah, it is. So yeah, so chondrites and especially carbonaceous chondrites are much uh, richer in carbon and other volatiles than the earth. Um, so that's because the earth, when it formed it, lost uh, many of its uh, volatile elements. So it's probably because <clears throat> it's probably because it was so hot when it formed that a lot of um, volatile elements um, were removed, were evaporated. Okay. Um, ejected planets were mentioned. Do you expect there to be many ejected planets between the stars? Yeah, I mean, that's something that we, we don't really know about very much. And um, so the ejected planets idea came from these models of planet migration. And um, planet migration itself is, is, is a fairly new concept. It's only been around for about 15 years or so. Um, and so we, we think that planets migrated in our solar system, but they migrate even more in other planetary systems. 
Um, so that would mean there would be uh, planets kind of roving around. But the problem is they're very hard to detect because we can only see um, planets around other star systems by looking at their effect on the star. And if they're just floating in space, they'd be almost invisible to us. Okay, so they could be hiding from us. Yes. Um, another question about solar wind. So my understanding is that the edge of the solar system is the shock wave formed by the solar wind, as beyond this is effectively interstellar space. Where is this front compared to the Oort cloud? Um, I think the Oort cloud is beyond that. So yeah, so it's, yeah, okay. it, then it's maybe not part of the solar system by that definition. Okay, just and just a couple more questions. I think I've covered yeah. most people. Uh, we've had, yeah, we've had like over 50 questions come in. So lots of people right. simulated by the talk. Um, the early dust clouds from which from suns were, which suns are formed were cold. What made the sun so hot? Likewise, why is the Earth's core so cold? Say that again, why is the, why is the sun so hot? Is that right? So it's the early dust clouds from which the suns are formed were cold. Yeah. What makes the sun so hot? And likewise, why is the Earth's core so cold? Um, well, the, I mean, the sun is hot because it is a nuclear reactor and it's fusing hydrogen into helium. But it started to, to warm up as it started to collapse. It converted potential energy into kinetic energy and that made it hotter. So it, it's hot partly because it was collapsing, but mostly it's hot because it's a massive nuclear reactor that's creating new elements. Uh, and the Earth's core, so the Earth gets most of its um, heating from uh, the decay of radioactive elements. So the abundance of radioactive elements de de determines its uh, temperature. So, I mean, it's not, it's, 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 it's cold, but it's not super cold. And because it's not fusing elements, it's much colder than the sun. Um. Where might we find dark matter in our Milky Way? I don't know. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, so is there anything else? Anybody? Oh, well, how how long will it take for the Earth to move out of its orbit? I think the Earth's in a fairly stable orbit. It's going to be there okay. till the Never. sun dies <laughs> forever. <laughs> yeah, forever. Well, for yeah, for at least for the next five billion years while the sun's still alive. Um, and then two more questions, and then I think we'll bring the talk to a close. But we have just one in the chat on why do we only have one sun in our solar system and not two? Yeah, I don't know. That's a great question because a lot of stars are binary stars. Um, and I think we have a lot to learn still about. I mean, I guess the big question that we all want to know is, are we special? Are we alone in the universe? Is there anything that made us different? And um yeah, things like having one star may play into that, but... Um, so still to be I found out. So people on this talk could find this out in the future. Yes, the, please. As yes, part of their yes, own research. Yes, please. <laughs> um, and then just very lastly, some people have, uh, lots and lots of people saying thank you. Uh, it's been a fantastic Aww. talk. And somebody has asked awesome. if you can re recommend any uh, publicly accessible books or resources for people who might want to learn more about this topic. Um, yeah, so um, oh, I'd suggest so my my uh, colleague uh, Caroline Smith and I wrote a book about meteorites, which is on Amazon. Um, uh, I don't know. I have to think. Can I? Can I? I'll let you know. I can send you a reading. Yeah, list. absolutely. We'll we'll add some notes to uh, the YouTube link um, as and when we have them. Great. Thanks so much, Sarah, for kicking off our Year of Space public lecture series. What a fantastic thanks. tour of the solar system. And thank you all to joining in. We've had hundreds of people join in to this, to this webinar. Uh, the next webinar is going to be in the first week of March on Mercury, the geology of Mercury, with Dave Rothery. Um, you can register for that now on, our, or through, on Eventbrite through our website. And we hopefully look forward to seeing you soon to explore more planets and rocks in the solar system. Thank you.